Welcome to the HCI Family of Podcasts, where your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We share our own original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. Join us for practitioner-oriented content around all things leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with the HCI family of podcasts. Julie Noonan, welcome to the conversation today. Thank you, John. I'm so grateful to be here. It is a pleasure to have you. You're joining us from Florida. I'm south of Salt Lake City in Utah. And today we're going to be talking about using reverse mentoring to bridge the generational divide in the workforce. We have many generations simultaneously working together right now in the workforce. People are working longer. Uh, so we have Gen Z, we have millennials, we have uh, Gen X, we have baby boomers, even some from the silent generation holding on desperately. Um, and the reality is, People are just working longer careers than ever before, in part because of longevity and people are staying healthy longer, uh, in part because of the economy and people feeling like they need to. Uh, anyways, regardless of the reason, we have to figure this out. We have to figure out how we can work to be work together better and more effectively. And sometimes there are these generational divides. And I'm, I always want to be careful. Like we don't want to make you know, sweeping over generalizations. Obviously, no one's, a, there's not a monolith when we talk about a particular generation. Everyone's unique. Everyone has their own unique priorities and values and, and whatnot. But in the aggregate, as we're kind of talking about these different groups, it can be helpful to think about how can we help them work together more effectively. And so that's what we're going to be exploring. And really, the reverse mentoring piece, how that could be helpful. So I'm, I'm super excited to explore this with you. As we get started, I wanted to share Julie's bio with everybody. Julie Noonan is an executive coach and change strategist working with organizations and their leaders to successfully ride the wave of change. Her specific focus is on the last of the boomer generation and how they are faring in the final years of their formal careers. She is passionate about intergenerational collaboration and reverse mentorship. She is also a fierce advocate of including age and DEI programs programs to fight against ageism in recruiting and downsizing. I really like that. Julie, anything else you would like to highlight by way of your background or personal context before we dive on in? Well, I've been a consultant and a, and a uh, coach for many years at this point. And uh, I came across this topic, one, because when I was 57, I was laid off. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it was one of those times when I was surprised when I went out with my resume, I held fairly senior positions, lots of, you know, lots of great experience. And as a consultant, I'd worked in many different industries. Yeah. And that was the first time in my life that I heard crickets <laughs> when I sent my resume out. And so it spurred me to re rethink what I wanted to do. So that's why I created my own company and why the focus on ageism as well as what the different generations um, can learn through each other. Yeah, yeah, well, I love that. And of course, ageism is not appropriate. We have laws to help try to help protect against that, but we all know that those types of biases still seep in, and people can come up with other reasons or excuses to you know to to try to sidestep that, right? Uh, and so, it, so it happens all the time, unfortunately, and. Uh, it, certainly it's not legal, it's not appropriate, um, but it's also just stupid because <laughs> you have all of this amassed experience, wisdom, um, knowledge, expertise that organizations just are systematically kind of weeding out from the pool of potential candidates to do stuff that they need done. It's So it's really dumb uh, of organizations mm -hmm to to engage in those types of behaviors and they may not realize they're engaging in those types of behaviors um but uh, you know taking a step back and trying to look at our systems or processes to see where you know ageism might be uh creeping in i, I just like any other type of diversity any other type of of a bias that might exist in the hiring process you know that's just super super important 
Absolutely. One of the things that that I have actually run across in my research around this topic for the last several years is um, there's there's an there are assumptions made, obviously, about all of the generations. But one mm -hmm. of the assumptions that's made on the last year of the boomers, mm -hmm. um, one of the assumptions that's made is that I don't know technology, yeah. that I'm afraid of technology that I am not um, innovative enough, uh, that I'm super competitive with um, fellow women executives, because that's how most of us were raised in my generation is to compete not only with our male counterparts, but also with our female counterparts. Mm -hmm. And um, and none of that is true across the board, just like some of the assumptions that are made with the younger generation is true across the board. Right. So, you know, it, when I started to see these things creeping in, one of the things that I did was talk with a, a lot of my clients and did a kind of a survey with them. And I said, what are the things that you're the most worried about? And as far as your career, as far as retirement, as far as this per, you know particular time in your life. And probably the number one thing that came up was I am afraid to become obsolete. Mm. And I'm almost afraid to ask for help mm. um, because I've never had to, you know, I've been the one people come to for help. And now I'm having to turn around and say, okay, I don't know how this works. Help me out here. So that's when the whole idea of um, reverse mentoring came to be. And this is not my idea. Uh, I ran across it. Jack Welch actually mm -hmm. coined the phrase in 1990s. What he did was he realized that his engineers at GE uh, were starting to lose skills that the younger generation of engineers that were coming up, um, they were getting the newest, latest and greatest, you know, technology information and, and uh, electronic information, et cetera. So what he did was he partnered the older, the older generations with the younger generations in order for uh, them to teach each other. And so when I ran across that, I thought, oh, my goodness, this is the end. This is the answer, because it's a it's a non-threatening way to ask questions of your mentee mentor. It is a is a partnership. It is not hierarchical in nature at all. Yeah. And um, it actually works well for me. I had been experiencing it without even knowing that with one of my <laughs> partners, one of my 1099 employees. Um. You know, I would I felt comfortable enough with her to ask her, how would you go about doing this particular thing and building, you know, social media marketing, for instance? How would you do this for how are you doing it for your business? She would teach me and then she would ask me questions about, um, you know, politics or mm -hmm. how do I negotiate with this particular client, et cetera. So we were co-mentoring each other. Yeah. And that's, you know, then I started to um, implement that in my practice. Yeah, I love that. I love the reverse mentoring idea. I love the co-mentoring idea. Uh, mm -hmm. I think both of those are very powerful. And yeah, just breaking down the assumptions around stereotypes. Now, does it hold, are there, is there a reason that those stereotypes exist? Yes, of yes. course. You know, I think of my father, who's a baby boomer, and I'm like, oh my goodness, anytime he calls and wants help with anything technologically oriented, I know I'm in for a, a wild ride, you know, oh, yeah. <laughs> it's good. <laughs> something, something that, you know, I, I am comfortable with and could do in like two minutes, I'm going to spend two hours, you know, trying to explain. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so that is that is my dad and he will fully admit that, right? Like I'm not saying anything he wouldn't joke, you know, about himself Absolutely. about. Um, but my dad is not everybody. Like th there are, are plenty of people, my dad's age that are very technologically savvy uh, and understand and stay up to date on those types of things and are, are very, very capable. Uh, and it's, it's when you look at the reverse types of stereotypes with like, um, uh, millennials and gen z you know a lot of times they get a bad rap for being kind of entitled or you know not willing to pay the dues or they don't have social skills they can't interact with human beings face to face or like you can name the stereotype does it apply to some is it a challenge and a struggle for some sure but 
is it for everybody? Absolutely not. So, mm-hmm. I mean, it, it's anytime we talk about any of these diversity issues, I just think it's so dumb because you're, you're unnecessarily um, thinning out the recruitment pool of good, talented people based on assumptions. And whether it's yeah. reverse age discrimination, not hiring someone because they're young and you think they're not capable, or whether it's uh, traditional uh, ageism or racism or sexism or bigotry of any sort, regardless, you, you know, you, we should be looking at, are you capable to do the work? Can you perform the functions of the job? Do you have the skills necessary and the competencies necessary? Or are you teachable so that you can learn the things that perhaps you don't know if you're pivoting in your career? Those are the types of things we should be trying to ascertain, uh, but we take mental shortcuts all the time and we lean on these biases and we lean on these stereotypes uh, and it's to our detriment. It's to the detriment of the individuals as well, of course, because then they um, struggle to find positions, but it's to the detriment of the organization. It just doesn't make sense. It's really stupid uh, from a business case perspective. And so we need to learn how to get past that. The the co-mentoring, the reverse mentoring, it's a perfect way to do it. And it can be really formalized. I mean, you can have formal mentoring programs within organizations, but it can be very informal and organic as well. Like we can start to develop cultures of mentorship within our organizations where anyone and everyone mentors each other and helps each other. And it's like continuous upskilling and learning and development where we're all supporting each other in that. That's the type of organization I want to work for. And I would suspect you were, you were talking about, you know, a client who, who is a, a, a baby boomer, like fearful of being obsolete. Everyone is fearful of being obsolete. Um, and I bet that person would really love to be in a workplace where they feel safe to ask questions, where they feel safe yes. to seek help. And that they're not going to be like found out as being obsolete, right? Um, Absolutely. Because that, that's what I heard when you when you shared that. I'm like, oh, they they they're worried about people finding out they don't know what they're doing and being branded as obsolete and then losing their job. And that's mm-hmm. terrible. If if that's the kind of toxic environment that we have, we have the power to create a more energizing, empowering, learning type of culture and environment of mentorship. Absolutely. I think that when when I heard that, and it was a pretty consistent finding when I did the research with my client base, it was, I don't want to be obsolete. I'm yeah. terrified that they're going to, to put me on special projects. Mm-hmm. You know, they're going to uh, put me out to pasture. I'm not ready. Um, and people now are redefining what retirement means. For sure. Because yeah. it's not it's not an age anymore. Um, sure, from the federal government perspective, and when, <clears throat> when I can get Medicaid or Medicare, that matters. But um, most most of the, at least the younger baby boomer generation has a lot more to give, mm-hmm. only they're struggling with where do I give it? And frankly, yeah. they don't want to give it for free in a lot of cases, mm-hmm. you know, um, and they do feel like that they are being uh, blocked from continuing to have the the kind of status and the kind of seniority that they have have enjoyed because they're aging. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I find myself uh, doing the uh, 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 and stuttering and and trying to find my words, and I just turned sixty. Mm-hmm. That's just part of aging. Mm-hmm. Um, so we need to be able to recognize when we are still able um, to provide value to the organization and demonstrate that in a way that shows our wisdom, mm-hmm. shows how we can help prevent the same problems from happening over and over and over again. Right. You know, I I can't tell you how many, well, you know, I would go from one client to another. And of course, I saw all the same stuff. And when I was able to um, help a client not fall into that hole, because I had had experienced it before, that was very, very um, encouraging for me. Mm-hmm. And it was great for the client. 
how much money and how much did I save them and how much value did I add just by helping them avoid a situation that I had experienced prior. So we can't throw everything out by the other, on the other hand, um, when we look at our, uh, our younger generations and make those assumptions, um, you know, they're lazy. They don't like to come to work. They haven't paid their dues, whatever. The bottom line is what they bring to the organizations that especially since COVID and, and the remote working, um, their values are coming into our organizations now. And frankly, the values of, you know, work-life balance, of diversity, of collaborative engagement, all of those values sped up tremendously. I think it would have taken t- twice or three times as long yeah. to get those values into corporate America um, before COVID. And so I'm I'm very grateful for some of the changes that they've brought into the workforce. Actually, it lets me live my nomadic life. <laughs> I can work yeah, from anywhere. No, I, I, I completely agree. I, I think the pandemic sped up and accelerated um, the shift in a lot of ways. Uh, and it, it, it just gave people time to step back and reevaluate uh, priorities, values, but also just like organizational norms. Like we, we just always have done things a certain way because that's how we've always done it. And for the first right. time, we're like, oh, we can't continue to do things the same way. So let's take a step back and see what actually needs to happen. And, and I think we upended the status quo in many super healthy ways during the pandemic, it, you know, it, as bad as and as negatively impactful right. as the pandemic was for a lot of people, I can acknowledge like it, it had its benefits. Um, mm-hmm. the, but now, you know, you see many, um, many executives and leaders trying to basically go back in time pre pandemic to reset to how things were, because that's what they're used to and comfortable with. And that's not going to work either. And so like just leaning into the change, leaning into understanding, like we always need to understand the values and the priorities of the workforce. That's extra challenging, probably when you have people from vastly different generations uh, co-mingling in the workforce, trying to work together. Uh, And, you know, we can, we can bemoan, you know, a particular generation's kind of stereotypical characteristics but ultimately it doesn't really matter. Like whether we like it or not, that's the workforce we have. And we have to figure out how we can work effectively together to accomplish what needs to be done to add value to the market. So the organization can continue to thrive and and Mm -hmm. we can do great things. There's no way around that. We can't just, you know, say, Oh, these stinking millennial and Gen Z people, you know, they're so entitled. I mean, we can think that in our heads, but if we practice that out in reality, we're simply going to forfeit the opportunity to get a whole bunch of great talent and we're going to become obsolete. So not only are workers concerned about becoming obsolete, organizations should be worried about becoming obsolete (laughs) if they're not leveraging the the full human capital capacity of the people, um, you know, at their fingertips. I have an excellent example of, of what you were saying about um, some, some of the organizations want to go back. Mm -hmm. Uh, There is one organization that I've, that I've been working with, they're one of my clients who um, they are concerned that their workforce um, it does not want to come back to the office. And they mm-hmm. really are concerned about what is lost with the lack of face-to-face. Right. And so what they've done is rather than put things together so that it would be um, rewarding to come into the office, Uh, What they've done is they've said everybody has to come into the office five days a month Mm -hmm. and they're actually they're actually looking at where they log in from their IP address as well as uh, the card swipes. Mm -hmm. And I just I'm thinking to myself, if I if I was actually an employee there, I would feel kind of resentful of that, (laughs) you know, Why, why don't you make it worth my while to spend two hours in a commute to come into the office yeah. as opposed to penalize me when I don't want to spend two hours, four hours a day going back and forth in the winter, in the snow. You know? <laughs> it just is not that that's 
to me, that is the opposite of change management, which is my consulting side of my business. Coaching, coaching is my other side. But um, I was I was kind of astounded because the the rest of the culture at this organization, um, it's almost anti cultural how they're doing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I completely agree, <laughs> and and so I think again, uh, finding ways for more intergenerational dialogue is really, yes. really important. Um, mentorship, reverse mentoring, co-mentoring, that's one way to foster mm -hmm. this intergenerational dialogue. Um, but it's not the only way. And and mm -hmm. I think ultimately we just need to focus, like recognize it's really important and focus on it and create a culture of just openness, transparency, sharing, you know, knowledge sharing, learning, coaching, mentoring, development. You know, that's what every organization needs to be agile and adaptive in the current market and to continue to add value. Um, that's what everyone wants. That's what yes. young people yeah. want. That's what older people want everywhere in between. Um, and everyone is probably lacking in some sort of skill or competency. That's the other thing that always kind of gets me when, when you start having like an ageism conversation and people are like, oh, you know, when they, when they start, when they try to tr justify like not hiring older people, I'm like, Okay, maybe, and again, we don't want to stereotype and we don't want to no. just assume, but maybe it is the case that, you know, XYZ older mm -hmm. person who's applying is lacking in some way. But guess what? We are we are all lacking in various ways. <laughs> like, I don't know of anyone who's the 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 golden unicorn who like has every last Everything. thing. Correct. Everyone has things they need to work on. Everyone has things they need to develop. Mm -hmm. uh, younger people do, older people do everywhere in between needs to. So it's, it's like, you're just asking, you're having the wrong conversation and asking the wrong question, right? If that's your focus uh, about like, oh, what's the, what's the gap? And I'm not going to hire this person because they don't have everything that I want. That's a really dumb way to go about recruiting and hiring. Uh, and so, especially in a tight labor market, especially mm -hmm. in a skills deficiency labor market, um, you know, we, we have to, we have to figure out internally within organizations, how to reskill and upskill our people and just accept like, yeah, most people, the vast majority of people are going to be deficient in one way or another, maybe multiple ways. Mm -hmm. So we have to decide and prioritize what's the most critical, the most important, and then help people develop the rest. Right. Exactly. And, you know, just like people bring weaknesses or deficiencies, they bring strengths. Absolutely. They bring things that they do better than anyone else. Mm -hmm. And that is regardless of what age you are. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So getting that's an even better thing to do is get out of the deficit approach and mindset and get into a strength based mm -hmm. approach and mindset and look for what people bring to the table rather than ruminating on what perceived deficiency might exist or not exist with, with an, a given individual. Well, Julie, mm -hmm. this has just been a great conversation. I know at the time I need to let you go, but before we wrap things up for today, I wanted to give you a chance to share with the audience how they can connect with you, find out more about your work, and then give us a final word on the topic for today. Excellent. Um, definitely connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, and then my website is julienoonan.com. So feel free to go there. Um, I do... You know, I do have a Catalan function. So if you'd like to speak with me directly about this topic or in the rest of my business, change management consulting and or executive coaching, I'm available there. And um, the last word on this is people are extremely talented when you let them show their talent. And that also means letting them continue to learn. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. regardless of where they are in their career. Yeah. Amen. Well said, mm -hmm. Julie, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. I encourage the audience to reach out, get connected, find out more about Ju what Julie can do for you. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the podcast. We hope you stay healthy and safe and please join us again soon.